Hi guys, um, so today we'll start getting into some more mechanisms of uh, PCP. Let me present. All right. Um, so last time we, uh, last time I recorded a lecture for you guys, we talked about uh, reliable uh, data transfer, or data transmission 3.0, which is a pretty correct protocol in that it um, can deal with uh, packet loss and packet corruption, and um, that's great. Um, but unfortunately, its performance is not so great. So let's see what um, let's see what the performance is, and then let's see how we can improve it with pipelining data transmissions. So um, what we have here is the um, transmission delay of transmission. Um, of some packet X. All right, that doesn't terribly matter. But what we have is the amount of data we're sending, which is let's say um, 8,000 bit packet, okay, um, on a one gigabit per second link, which is going to be the rate. So you'll notice um, when we talk about network performance, we generally talk about bits, not bytes. So this is a uh, thousand byte packet. Um, why that is, is uh, just for historical reasons, but um, usually we have transmission in terms of gigabits per second, um, and so we need to do that conversion to bytes. Okay, so we have um, 8,000 bits over 10 to the nine bits per second, that's one gigabit per second link. And so when we do this division, we find out that it takes 0 0.008 milliseconds, so pretty quickly to actually transmit um, those bits on on a link that is that fast. Okay, so now we can look at the link utilization or basically the fraction of time that the sender is actually transmitting, right? If the sender is not transmitting, well, that's bad because it doesn't matter how fast the link is, we're not using it. Um, and then we can assume there's a 15 millisecond propagation delay um, and that the acknowledged packets are really negligible in terms of size. So we don't really need to calculate their uh, transmission delay. All right, so the utilization on that link is going to be the, the amount of time we're transmitting, which is this, okay, divided by the time it takes to get an acknowledgement, which is going to be propagation delay times two, right, to get data up there and back, um, plus the actual transmission time of the packet. So to get an acknowledgement, first we need to transmit the packet, then do the propagation delay one way and propagation delay the other way for the acknowledgement. And so it takes us uh, 30 milliseconds, two times 15, plus the transmission time, the serialization time of a packet. So 30 milliseconds plus uh, 008 milliseconds uh, in the denominator. So that's kind of the, the time to get an acknowledgement. And this is the time that the sender is actually transmitting. When we calculate this utilization, you'll see that it's a, a very, very small ratio. So, um, okay, that's potentially bad, but let's see what it looks like. So the link good put, or basically the amount of data that we're delivering over time is 8,000 bits over, or we're delivering that many bits every 30 or so milliseconds. And so effectively we're getting uh, 267 kilobits per second transmission data rate or good put, okay? So when you think about that we're using a one gigabit per second link, that is decidedly puny. So what can we do to actually get better utilization and higher throughput? Before we get into that, let's uh, visualize this to make sure we understand what's happening. So we are the sender, we have a sender and a receiver. The sender is transmitting some data, right? It takes some time to serialize those um, 8,000 bits. Okay, and then when the last bit, bit gets to the receiver, the receiver can send an acknowledgement, um, and that's our round trip time from the last bit being sent to the last bit uh, to the acknowledgement being received. So we have the serialization time of the link, uh, that's the utilization, and the time to actually get the acknowledgement is from here to here, so round trip time plus serialization delay. That's our denominator, and our kind of the useful time is the serialization time of the packet, which is up here. That's how we get this calculation. 
Okay, so this is basically a what's called a stop and wait protocol. Now, if we pipeline it, our situation begins to look like this. We transmit one packet, then another packet in the sequence and another packet in the sequence. So if we have more data to send, we can start generating all these different packets. And then we're going to get acknowledgements for them um, when, they, when they arrive, right? When they're generated by the receiver and they arrive. And when they do so, we can transmit the next packet in the sequence. So the sender has multiple in-flight packets that are yet to be acknowledged. Um, and the range of sequence numbers has to be increased. So this is packet one, packet two, packet three, and then after the acknowledgement, this would be packet four, packet five, right? So we need to keep track of those. Um, and um, we'll talk about re what happens when you do retransmissions. There's a possibility for duplicate packets. And so the sender and receiver needs to buffer packets to uh, kind of detect, uh, to keep track of sequence numbers to detect duplicates. And it needs to buffer them to, for the receiver to give those packets or the data in those packets in order um, into the application layer process. So I'll walk through all of that in detail, but what you can see is that even if we allow pipelining of three packets, we basically have our utilization goes up to three LR, okay, which basically increases our uh, utilization, link utilization by a factor of three. All right, so pipelining is eminently good as long as we can um, kind of deal with lost packets, retransmissions, lost acts, etc. Okay, so two recent packets, we have basically two different mechanisms and I'll get into those in detail. Those two mechanisms are go back N and selective repeat. So under go back N, the sender can have up to N unacknowledgement pack, unacknowledged packets in the pipeline. Um, and the receiver only sends cumulative acts for the last contiguous packet that it has received. I'll illustrate that in a second. Um, and the sender also has one timer or one timeout um, sort of per link, right? So it only keeps track of the last packet that it needs to retransmit, the last, the oldest unacknowledged packet. Um, selective repeat, on the other hand, um, also can have up to unacknowledged, un un unacknowledged packets and the receiver sends individual acknowledgements for each received packet, which allows the sender to kind of resend only the packets that have been uh, lost, that didn't get there, but it does require the sender to maintain a timer on per packet basis um, to know when those individual timers um, or packets time out. All right, let's look at those in detail. Um, oh, and uh, when we're done with the discussion, you can kind of uh, talk about what are the, or uh, start a discussion on the discussion group as to what are the relative advantages and disadvantages of each protocol. Okay. So when we talk about go back N, we need to discuss um, this window size N, which I mentioned there's N unacknowledged packets. What does that mean? Well, we have a series of packets to send. Let's say we have a gigabyte of data to send that is passed to the transportation layer, uh, to the transport layer, and the transport layer uh, takes this big data, divides it into packet, packets, and starts transmitting those. So here we have already, the transport layer has already transmitted these packets, or packets with this um, sequence number, all right? And then here starts packet that, packets that have been transmitted to the receiver, but that haven't yet been acknowledged. Okay, so the packet's transmitted, but no X received. And then um, after that are packets to yet to be transmitted. Okay, so those haven't been, so here we have transmitted and acknowledged, just transmitted, but not yet acknowledged, and then, and then data that hasn't been transmitted yet. Right? And now this window of packet of size N starts at the first unacknowledged packet. Okay, so that sender can sort of have all these packets in flight. This is kind of the thickness of the pipeline before those three packets. Now it's size N. Um, so the sender can send all these different packets, but cannot start sending this packet unless uh, this packet has been acknowledged. Okay, let's look at this on, on an example. So here we have a series of packets to, 
to send are n equals 4, and so we have a window of size 4. Okay? The sender starts sending these packets, sends packet 1, 2, 3, 4, as permitted by the window. Okay? So these packets are transmitted. Now packet 2 happens to be lost. Okay? The receiver gets packets 0, 1, and 3, and generates acknowledgments for those, um, for those packets. Okay? So let's see how it does it. So we receive packet 0 and send acknowledgement 0. This is great. We receive packet 1 and send acknowledgement for it. This packet is in sequence. That's also great. Okay, so now we have two acts, um, two acknowledgements going back to the sender. Packet 2 doesn't get there. Okay, so we get packet 3. Now, with packet 3, we can say, well, we're not expecting packet 3. We're expecting packet 2. So, in fact, we're going to discard it and we're going to resend the acknowledgement for packet one. Okay, so we got something, we can acknowledge that we got something, but we really just got, we really just acknowledged the last contiguous data that we received. All right, so the sender then sees the first two acknowledgements for packet zero and uh, packet one, okay? Um, that allows it to basically move its sender window forward here and here, okay, because now it knows that packet zero and packet one have been acknowledged and start sending um, next packets in the sequence, which is packets uh, four and five. Okay, basically the window moves on and now we have packets four and five that can be transmitted. Okay, um, now what we're getting here is an acknowledgement for packet one again. We're just going to ignore it because we already got it. So that's great. Um, but now the timeout uh, times out. Okay. So packet two is the one that hasn't been acknowledged. Okay. That's the timeout that is maintained. And basically first there's a timeout for packet zero. It gets moved up here. Then we have a timeout for packet one, but it gets acknowledged. So we move to packet two. Packet two, um, the timeout starts at the sending time of packet two and here it expires, and now the sender retransmit everything going on, everything starting from packet two, which is packet two, three, four, and five, uh, which is basically its window. And now, um, let's say those packets get through, the receiver can start acknowledging them, allowing the window to move forward further when those acknowledgements are received. Okay, so let's go back in. We basically go back and packets to start retransmitting from the uh, portion of the window from the position in the window that hasn't been yet acknowledged. All right, you can see there are some inefficiencies with that. Under selective repeat, we still have this window of size n. There can only still be um, n outstanding packets, but those packets are acknowledged individually. So here we have packets that have been acknowledged before the window, the, the window moved forward. We have then packets here that have been acknowledged. Okay, those dark blue. And then we have packets that have been sent but not yet acknowledged. Okay? And so the first unacknowledged packet kind of holds up the window, right? When those acknowledgements are received, the window can then move on to the next unacknowledged packet um, and allow sort of extra transmissions to happen in this part of the sequence. All right, let's look at the same example um, under selective repeat. So, what we have here is the same transmission, packet 0, 1, 2, and 3, packet 2 gets lost. We get acknowledgements for packet um, 0 and 1. And then when we receive packet 3, there is acknowledgement sent um, for uh, packet 3. And this packet is buffered. It is not yet delivered to um, the application. We can only deliver, we can still only deliver packets that are uh, received in order. Okay, so on the sender, there's an acknowledgement zero and one. The window moves forward as before. And now there is a um, timeout just as before for packet two. So at this point, we can retransmit packet two because we know that um, that's the one that has been received. So we can uh, kind of resend it. And now when that packet arrives at the receiver, it is delivered and um, now packet three can also be um, 
taken out from the buffer and delivered and then you know there's a transmission of packets um, uh, four and five which are also which are also delivered at this point when packet two arrives okay so we don't need to retransmit as much um, we don't need to retransmit packet three because it has been buffered and we kind of know that from the acknowledgement that we received all right so that's the difference in, in the two um, you can kind of figure out what are the uh, kind of argue for the pros and cons of, of each um, protocol. All right. Um, there is, however, a weird thing that can happen under selective repeat, um, which is the selective repeat dilemma. So let's look at the two scenarios on the right and um, let's see what is the difference in them to the receiver. So in the first scenario, the sender sends three packets, 0, 1, and 2, and then the receiver generates acknowledgments for those, okay? but all those acknowledgments get, get lost. So what happens is that the sender times out and retransmits packet 0. Okay? Um, on the other hand, what else could happen is that the sender transmits packets 0, 1, and 2. Those are acknowledged and the sender then sends the next packet in its sequence number, which is three. That packet gets lost, but that still allows the, um, when the acknowledgement arrives for uh, packet uh, one, okay, the sequence number then recycles and allows, pack, and allows the sender to send packet zero, which is now a different packet zero. Right? The sequence number cannot go forever. There is a limitation in terms of how many bits you can store in, a, in, a, in an integer, let's say. Right? And so eventually we have to recycle these sequence numbers. But from the point of view of the receiver, um, the receiver doesn't really know what is the difference between those two scenarios. Either way, um, it seems that uh, there's packets 0, 1, and 2 arriving, and then packets 0 arriving again. So... Um, Right? There needs to be some disambiguation between the two because obviously this one is a retransmission and this one is what we could call packet four <laughs> right? after the sequence number recycles. So um, how can we solve this problem? Right? Um, and the solution to this is that the uh, number of available sequence numbers has to be much larger than the size of the window. Okay. If your window is much smaller than this set of available sequence numbers, you're not going to have this issue where um, the receiver kind of can't disambiguate between this, the beginning of a sequence of one sequence and the beginning of another sequence. Um, you may think that that's kind of a silly problem to have, but um, when you have very high capacity links that allow you to send a lot of packets um, that are also very low latency, those sequence numbers can actually get pretty high. Right? And so that's something that um, um, you, know, you need to make sure that doesn't happen on your link, that you basically have enough sequence numbers um, to, kind of to, to, to deal with the fact that there could be many, many sequences in flight. Right? Maybe you can say, oh, it, TCP is not a problem, but if you're trying to use this mechanism in your own protocol, right? or maybe inside your application, um, then just be aware of this selective repeat has this particular problem. All right, another issue we could talk about is how much time a, the sender should wait before retransmitting a packet. So basically how to set the TCP timeout value. If it's too short, we're going to prematurely uh, retransmit something that is unnecessary. And if this reaction is too long, then obviously we're gonna wait too long to retransmit something that's needed, okay? Um, you could say, well, this timeout before packet is retransmitted should be longer than the round trip time. Okay, that makes sense, right? We have we need to allow for um, you know this the the packet one to arrive and then for the acknowledgement to come back before we retransmit the packet, right? If um, if you know our timeout is shorter than the round trip time, then we're going to be retransmitting all the time, um, right? Before the acknowledgements can arrive. So okay. It needs to be longer than the round trip time, but round trip time also varies over time because of congestion in the network. So, um, what to do? What to do? 
right? You can say, well, we're going to um, estimate round trip time. Let's say this is going to be a, we're going to call this sample round trip time. Um, we're just basically measuring the time from when we send the packet to when we get an acknowledgement, um, right? And this will vary over time. So maybe we want to do some sort of a running average, right? You could say it's a running average and then you have some estimate of it, all right? So let's see what this running average might look like. We have sample RTT, which is the round trip time um, at different instances during the connection. Here graphed on the x-axis is time, um, or kind of the, the time of measurement, I should say. And on the y-axis, we have the round trip time um, as, as measured by um, the TCP connection or measured by probing, in this case, the time to, from the time when we send a packet to the time when we get an acknowledgement for it. Okay. So you can see that over time, sample RTT varies um, somewhat, right, in a, in a um, kind of a jagged way, right, this line is, is sort of jagged, but it, we can compute its running average, right, as estimated RTT, which is one minus alpha estimated RTT, the previous value of this running average, plus alpha times sample RTT, which is kind of the sample at any given point, okay? And then you can kind of decide how much influence you want to give to the new data, um, which is basically the alpha could be set to something like um, one eighth. Okay, so basically the new sample data has like one eighth influence over what you've had before. Um, you probably have seen this graph recently. If you look at kind of New York Times front page, you'll see sort of the daily corona cases and a two week average of corona cases, right? So this is basically the same, the same idea, okay? So what should we do? Should we set the uh, TCP timeout to the estimated RTT? Well, it turns out that's actually a pretty bad idea because you'd be wrong about half the time. <laughs> Right, uh, you would time out in the you know too late or too often or too quickly, um, basically all the time. <laughs> so, um, what we want to do is set the timeout to the estimated RTT plus safety margin. Right, we want to kind of err on the side of not retransmitting too often, actually. Right, so there's always a chance that a packet will still get there, that it's just delayed, right? We do want to retransmit it eventually, but we don't want to be too aggressive about it because then we're just putting more data in the network, causing more congestion. Um, and so it turns out that sort of like a, um, a, a more conservative retransmission approach is better for overall network performance, right? And so what we can do is um, estimate sample RTT deviation from estimated RTT, all right? So basically the difference between um, kind of here and here, okay? The difference between those two. Um, and we can also do it as a, as a running average, okay? So we have this deviation from RTT, um, which is one minus beta times the previous running average plus beta times and then here's the difference, sample RTT minus estimated RTT, the absolute value of, okay? So we get an idea of how far on average um, these, the peaks and valleys are from um, the, sample, the sample RTT or the estimated RTT in uh, magenta. All right, so our timeout interval, turns out it's a good value to set it to um, estimated RTT plus four times this um, deviation from RTT used as a safety margin, okay? So effectively, our timeout line would be, okay, let's say there's a difference, the deviation from RTT is about, I don't know, 50 milliseconds, so from here we can say this is one, two, three, four, about here would be the timeout for this TCP connection, okay? So it tends to be somewhat long um, in an effort to avoid retransmissions, um, but not avoid them kind of too, too much, right? Okay, um, now that we talked about these, these mechanisms, let's actually talk a little bit more about what happens in, um, with the sequence numbers in a TCP connection. So we're moving further and further into TCP, into the world of TCP. Okay, so first is the logs acknowledgement scenario. So what we have is we're transmitting some data 
um, that's buffered at host A. And the sequence number is 92. And now we're transmitting eight bytes of data. What happens then is that the acknowledgement is for the hundredth byte, right? So we sent 92 bytes before. Now we send the next eight bytes. And the acknowledgement is for the hundred byte, hundredth byte that arrived in this packet. Okay, that is lost. Okay, and then we, after a timeout, we end up retransmitting um, same eight bytes of data, and then get acknowledgement 100. All right. So in TCP, we're not really maintaining. Um, we, we are maintaining sequence numbers, and those numbers do rotate. However, what we're not the way they grow is not by the number of packets that have been transmitted, but by the number of bytes that have been received. Okay, so sequence numbers related to bytes, uh, to the number of bytes that have been sent, not the number of packets that have been sent. All right, so here's another example, um, and this one is um, also based on a premature timeout. Okay, so we send a packet, eight bytes of data, sequence 92. We get the acknowledgement of 100. And then we send the next 20 bytes of data, and so we get acknowledgement 120. Okay, so acknowledgements coming back are 100 and um, 120. Great. So we send, um, the timeout is premature, and so we end up resending those um, 8 bytes of data, but now the acknowledgement is cumulative. Okay, so when we, when we get a duplicate ACK, okay, we get the acknowledgement for the cumulative amount of data that has arrived, and so not 100, but 120 based on this packet arriving as well. All right, and here's another illustration for it, of it, um, where of a cumulative acknowledgement where we have sent two packets, the first ACK is lost, but the second ACK is cumulative. Okay, and so we're basically um, acknowledging when the receiver is basically acknowledging always the last uh, sequence number that is contiguously that has been contiguously forwarded to the application layer right and um, you can ask yourself if this is an illustration of a go back n or um, selective repeat all right so here's some rules um, in tcp for acknowledgement generation it's actually a little bit more complicated than i described and so let's look at this table so when we have an arrival of an in-order segment, meaning there's no gaps in the sequence number um, at the receiver. Okay, um, we're going to do something. And okay, so we have an an, an arrival of an in-order segment with the expected sequence number, and all data up to the expected sequence number has already been acknowledged. Okay, the action of the TCP receiver will actually be to try to delay this act. Okay, so it will wait up to 500 milliseconds for another segment to arrive. If nothing else arrives, then the acknowledgement will be generated. This is basically an effort to not acknowledge every packet that, that gets sent, um, but every other packet. Okay, so here's the other case. We have the arrival of an in-order segment with expected sequence number. Okay, and then one other segment has already acknowledgement pending. That would be this case above. Okay. So in this case, we send a single cumulative acknowledgement, um, acknowledging both in-order segments, or basically um, acknowledging the byte of the last byte of um, the second transmission. All right. Or we could have arrival of out of or out of order segments with higher than expected sequence number. All right. So we have there's some packet that has been not uh, received at the receiver. And now there's this gap. Right, so TCP will send a duplicate acknowledgement for the data that has been um, arrived, um, received in sequence, kind of indicating to the sender what bytes are missing or what bytes to retransmit, which basically means bytes right after this duplicate, whatever is acknowledged by this duplicate acknowledgement. Okay, and if there's an arrival of a segment that partially fills or completely fills this gap that's been created, observed here, we're going to immediately send an acknowledgement um, provided that uh, this segment fills the gap kind of at the lower end of the gap. Okay, so we're not going to wait for a, um, we're not going to try to delay this act, but we'll try to send it immediately. And, you know, this gets a little abstract, but um, I would encourage you guys to take a piece of paper, um, 
use a figure like this and try to draw out these different scenarios and what acts are generated in under um, what conditions. Okay. The final uh, mechanism here about TCP transmissions um, that I want to talk about is uh, fast retransmit. Um, and so what happens is that this timeout, right, we, we set it to be quite long. We want to kind of avoid retransmissions um, if there's a chance that the packet is simply delayed, right? And so, or if there's, or maybe the egg got lost, but we can wait for a cumulative act. And so um, this timeout, you know, it works pretty well for it to be, to be longer. However, there's a faster way to detect um, lost segments. So for example, if we send these four packets, okay, the first one being sequence number 92 with eight bytes of data, the acknowledgement for that will be ACK100. And now this packet is lost and there's other packets that make it, but the acknowledgement here will also be for 100, 100, 100, right? The uh, host B simply keeps acknowledging the last um, in-sequence data that has been received. When the sender sees all these acts saying ACK100, 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 it knows that packets are getting through it's just that some packets after the byte 100 didn't get through, okay? So when it receives these three duplicate acts, or when, um, these are four, but when it receives three duplicate acts, it can, well, actually, no. So this is the first act, and now these are the duplicate acts, okay? So there's three of them. Then it's going to, to basically transmit data starting at um, sequence 100, okay? So again, the sender knows that packets are getting through but it knows that something didn't get through, so it doesn't wait for the timeout. It quickly does this fast retransmit of um, data that hasn't yet been acknowledged. All right, so that's it for today. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I know this is kind of action-packed. Um, we have a, a, a lab on this, um, so you guys can kind of investigate this in detail. Um, and, um, this is also part of your extra credit for the programming assignment too. So if someone wants to implement this pipeline implementation, well, now I get an idea of how it works or how it should work. All right. Thank you.